Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Bonham Smith, and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Science. Welcome to the University of Saskatchewan and the annual My Writing Life Lecture. To everyone watching the live stream from home, hello, and thank you for joining us. As we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Tonight, we are proud to host a talk by Katharina Vermette, this year's Arts and Science Book Club author. Every year, we choose one book that the entire College of Arts and Science is invited and encouraged to read. From dozens of nominations, we look for a single book with the vision and depth to reach across our diverse college. We choose a book that can bring together our college and all of you in our community for a meaningful conversation. Katharina Vermette's novel, The Break, is exactly such a book. When it was first published in 2016, it was immediately recognized by readers and critics as one of the most important novels of the year. The Break tackles issues of racism and violence. It is a story about trauma, how it stays with us, how it travels through generations, and how it can be healed. It is an extremely valuable book for Canadians to read today in 2019. We've invited Katharina to the University of Saskatchewan to speak not only about the break, but also about her perspective as a writer. On and off the page, great writers can inspire us and bring clarity to the world in which we live. This is what the College of Arts and Sciences My Writing Life Lecture Series is all about. As both a poet and a prose writer, Katharina Vermette's work has resonated with Canadians. She is a Métis writer from Treaty One Territory, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her first book, North End Love Songs, won the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry. Her second book of poetry, River Woman, was released in the fall of 2018. She is also the author of the children's series, The Seven Teaching Stories, and the young adult series, A Girl Called Echo. She co-wrote and co-directed the short documentary, This River, which won the 2017 Canadian Screen Award for Best Short. It's pretty all round. Katharina's debut novel, The Break, is a Canadian bestseller and the winner of multiple awards, including the Burt Award for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Literature, and the Amazon First Novel Award. Please join me in welcoming the 2019 Arts and Science Book Club author, Katharina Vermette. Hi. My water is so low to the ground, I have to keep, I'm gonna keep, pay a lot of, play a lot of peekaboo. Mm. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here. Wow. And there's people up there, too. Wow, hi. <laughs> I'm honored to be here on this beautiful campus. I have been, I'm only here for the day. I've been treated so well. This is the kind of day where I feel very loved and blessed. I have an itinerary. I had scheduled free time and such close attention to making sure that free time was relaxing. It's great. Um, I'm just putting my phone out here so I can keep track of time, because I tend to go over. Not intentional at all. Um, I just tend to get wrapped up in, in, in what I'm trying to do. Um, so, disclaimer, I don't give lectures or keynotes. Whenever I think of those words in my head, I blank, and I can't quite think of anything 
intelligent to say. So I prefer to call my talks talks. Or maybe my most comfortable form is a poetry reading. So you're walking into a poetry reading. I'm sorry if I misled you. Or you were misled, I didn't do it. I never said, I never called it a lecture. Um, interesting though that it was called my writing life because I find that funny because for years uh, when I was getting started in, in writing, um, I had a little folder in my inbox at my Gmail account that said writing life. And it was all those things that were kind of related to writing, all those you know, chance gigs and opportunities that I got to submit into places. And for a really long time, that was a very small part of my life. And it was, it was just me writing poetry um, and writing stories and really putting them out there into the world, hoping for the best and getting back a lot of rejections. But every now and then getting those emails that I could put into the My Writing Life folder. So I was really thinking of that as I was thinking about what I was going to say. Um, I've since moved on and kind of made a little bit of a business out of this, and I have several folders of several different writing life, and it, became, and it got really monstrous, and I had to make new folders, which is, you know, the sheer sign of success is how many folders you get to have in your <laughs> Gmail account. You know, really, that's it. And particularly when you get to switch those folders and delete them because the project's over. And, ah, I love that feeling. Um, so really my writing life. Um, everything kind of comes in and comes from the same place. Um, I'm not going to read from the novel. I wanted to read my poetry that kind of surrounds the novel because I really write in tandem with many different genres. I occasionally write children's books. Um, I was talking this afternoon about how everything has its own sound and has its own beat. And children's literature is has this very distinct sound, and you know that it's something for children just by the way it comes and the way it lays out on the page. And the same is very much true for poetry. Poetry kind of comes in as song, and sometimes it comes in as really rough song, and you have to edit it forever until it becomes something. But it really has become a place for me to talk more about myself than I do anywhere else. Um, I never want to write a memoir. Quote me on that. I never want to write a memoir. I never, I know it's a big thing right now for everyone to write these memoirs and these nonfiction books. I couldn't hope to try. Um, that, like rhyming, is something I do not have the skill to do. So instead, I write my, my life in poetry, my writing life. Ha ha. See, link there. But what I try to do in every genre I write is I try to find truth and articulate my truth to the best of my ability, and sometimes that is very easy, and sometimes it is very, very difficult. Um, and what I really strive to do is to find beauty. There's a beautiful quote by the English teachers, will get me. I think it's Keats, it might be Yeats, I get them confused. And I have an English degree, I'm sorry, it was a while ago, I forgot it. But the quote is, um, beauty is truth, truth beauty. Yeah, there's more to that, but that's all you need to know. Um, because I can't even remember if it's Yeats or Keats, and I didn't mean to, and I didn't even look it up. Bad me. But I love the idea, truth is beauty, beauty is truth. When you're able to articulate your own story and your own truth, that is beauty. When you're able to find the truth and you write the truth, even when it's raw stuff like what I write, it is beautiful. When I started writing this first book, North End Love Songs, I, I was also starting to write the novel, and I was talking about my childhood, and I was talking about where I grew up. And I grew up in a place that was not known to be beautiful, but still I found it beautiful because it was home. And writing about it, even writing when it felt like it was hard, became beautiful. So I wanted to read the poems that really kind of connect with different parts of the book. And those of you who are writing papers, you know, can, might be able to find linkages that I don't remember how to do because I'm no longer an English student. Um, <laughs> that's an awful way to start a poem. <laughs> but this is, I'm going to start with North End Love Songs. 
North End Love Songs came out in 2012. And really it was a time when it was my first book of poetry. It took me 10 years to get a book published and that was not for lack of trying. I submitted a lot, I wrote a lot, I got rejected an awful lot. I was told, and, and 2012 doesn't seem like it's really far away, but in the literary world in Canada, it is, an, it is a decade, or it is actually a decade away. It's decades away, because now we have so many young Indigenous writers and so many of our celebrated Indigenous authors who are coming to the forefront tonight, and I absolutely celebrate all of their successes. But when I wrote this book, there wasn't many of us out there. And that was not for lack of talent, and that was not for lack of trying, and that was not for lack of a willingness and ability to be there. It was for lack of opportunity. Um, this was the time when there seemed to be one Indigenous person per slate, per, pu per publisher. Um, and once they had their, their one Indigenous person, they didn't publish another one. Thankfully, times have changed. And thankfully, we have been absolutely exploded, or the talent has exploded outward. But that is only because of opportunity now. Indigenous authors have always been working. My friend and mentor Duncan McCurdy told me that my first book has to be about where I'm from because it, it is my introduction to the world. And as Indigenous persons, when we meet each other from different nations, the way we introduce ourselves is first by introducing our name and then introducing our clan and introducing where we are from. Where, where you are from tells me and tells the world more about who you are than what you do or any of those other inconsequential things. Because where we are from is in our bones, it's in our blood, it's in our memories. So to know about where I come from is to know about me. So I chose to write about the North End, which is the place that I grew up and the place that I became myself and really got into my bones and my blood. One of the things the North End has, and I know, I, I see it here when I come to Saskatoon as well, is we have magnificent elm trees. I love the elm trees. I know you have them along the river as well. We're we nodding. I, some people are not, I don't know exactly where they are. I think there's a river, and I think there's elm trees, and I remember coming here in the fall, and it looked like home. That was Saskatoon, right? Okay, good. Um, uh, my neighborhood was an older neighborhood and we had a lot of American elms also. Winnipeg actually boasts the highest population and collection, it's called a collection of American elms north of um, Central Park. And the funny thing about these elms is, that I love, is they are not actually indigenous to this place. We have different kind of elm trees. We have um, naturally occurring on, on our river banks but back in the day, before people were in Winnipeg in any great number, there were no American elm trees alongside the river, or alongside the streets. Um, when I first moved into the North End, I thought we had moved into a forest. And I was really disheartened to learn that this was not a naturally occurring phenomenon. I just thought we, you know, really carefully built the houses around the trees and they were just so perfectly aligned. And isn't that lucky that they're one in front of every house? That's like perfect. Um, how welcoming is nature to us? But they were actually planted there. They were planted, um, it was an early turn of the century, turn of last century um, initiative by city planners um, who wanted the city to look regal. They wanted it to look like Central Park in New York because that was when Winnipeg was gonna be the best city in Western Canada, don't you know? And it still is, totally. <laughs> um, but funny thing about Central Park, Central Park is not naturally occurring either. It was actually originally a swampland and, and then, a, a grassland rather, and it was all plowed away and all those American elms were also planted there. And I actually got to visit there for the first time this fall and it looks great, it looks like home. It looks like a naturally occurring forest in the middle of the city. Like, isn't it great that they just built around it and saved the trees? Um, but they didn't, of course. They made it happen. But again, trees are trees. And when they grow together, they look like they belong there, and they really take over. As we, anyone who knows the elms know, they really take over um, and do not die quietly. 
So I love this as a metaphor, this idea of the indigenous trees and the planted trees. You know where I'm going with this. Um, so I wrote a lot about the trees in this book, and I'll start with this one. It's called Family. Elms around us, like aunties, uncles, cousins, all different, but with the same skin. The tall one with thinning foliage sticking straight up, branches scratching at the sky. The wide one split in two, halfway up, looks like scissors or two legs bent and kicking. The gnarled one with warts all over its face. The one with the swirled branch curved out over Cathedral Avenue, looped like brown hair around a finger. But her favorites are the ones by the river. They spread low and stay close to earth. Those ones she can climb into, lean against the, do the strong dark bark, rest her small body within their round arms. Their sharp leaves reach out over the river. She watches how the waves fold into and out of each other, like family. And like any true poet, when I find a metaphor I like, I beat it with a stick until it dies, a very slow death, much like the elm trees. I had a um, old elm tree in my yard when I first moved into um, the house. Um, for trivial purposes, it was a ho the house that was next to the break. The break is an actual place in, in Winnipeg. Um, it is a hydro field, and I lived in a house next door, much like my character in the novel, Stella. And I had a big, gigantic, glorious elm tree that I loved when we first moved in. Um, and it was overpowering. And as soon as we moved in, of course, my neighbor said, you gotta kill that tree. And I said, I'm not killing a tree. That's a, that's a tree. Um, but it was wrecking his garage, and he was very adamant, and it was large, and you know, it had no leaves for a couple years, which means it's dying or dead. I didn't know that, because I know nothing. About, I grew up in the North End. How do I know about trees? Um, or how to take care of them anyway. I know how to look at them. So I had to watch the city come in and cut it down. Um, and that's what this poem is about. It's about those big glorious elms meeting their inevitable demise in some cases because they sometimes grow too big. So this is called Green Disease. And yes, that is a Pearl Jam song. And my epitaph in this poem, just to you know, round out my nerdiness from the Pearl Jam quote with an Ursula K. Le Guin quote, um, which is called, <laughs> which goes, my words are nothing, hear the leaves. She watches the city cut down trees, bright orange X, a kill mark spray painted across the bark. They come in an oversized white truck, stretch out a long metal arm with a large bucket at the end. A man gets in and rises up off the street like an elevator or a hot air balloon. With a loud buzzing saw, he starts at the top and cuts the leafy branches, sways gently back and forth as if carving sculpture or trimming hair. Branches fall lightly to the earth where other men absentmindedly gather them into a pile. She watches until the tree looks nothing like itself. It is naked, bald, amputated. The bucket lowers slightly, the trunk stabbed, the man cuts a short, thick piece until it loosens, falls heavy. Cut after cut until the tree is barely taller than the grass and the pieces sit around the stump like stones. When the men leave, she studies the pieces of the tree and tries to count the yellow rings that were once inside. But each blonde circle only blurs into the next. So as you might have guessed, I don't just, I'm not just talking about trees. I'm being clever and metaphoric. Just kidding, I always think I'm being clever and metaphoric and then people get it right away 
That's the beauty of poetry. You think you can hide, and you can't. You're actually revealing more of yourself. Um, in my case, I'm revealing how incredibly non-cryptic I can be. <laughs> but this is also one of those poems where I thought I was being cheeky. <clears throat> and really, it's very, I love reading this poem to kids, because then afterwards I say, and who am I talking about? And I get wild answers. So I'll see if, I, maybe I'll ask that. Maybe I'll see. Maybe I'll let you be. Or maybe I'll quiz you. Wildflowers. It's the wildflowers she feels sorry for. They gotta watch their backs. Nobody wants them around. People spread poison to kill them off. Call them weeds. She thinks it's a shame because if you let them just grow, they're really quite beautiful. Flowering pink or butter yellow can fill a dark space with a splendid green if you let them. But if they flower, they will seed. If you let them, they'll take over. They'll choke out all those poppies and marigolds, roses and daffodils. No planted flower stands a chance against a pack of weeds. So they get yanked, roots burned, concretes thrown over them. Still, they sprout up all over the place, push through cracks in the sidewalk, congregate on otherwise respectable lawns. Darn squatters, they're the ones who really got to watch their backs. I won't ask you who you think that's about. This is a flat surface. I have like three degrees. <laughs> so another way this book was like the break is I use a lot of pictures. I'm popping my peas today really badly. Um, I use a lot of pictures. And in the, in the novel, I, um, one of the young protagonists, Phoenix, she has a bag of pictures. She has no family, she just has her pictures. Um, and in the end, she looks over them and you kind of see a little bit more about her history through these things that she's carried with her forever. Um, I, like I said, I really wrote these books in tandem. And as I was you know, maybe teasing out my story from, from the stories of others, the fictional stories that I was, I, was, uh, I was writing. But they really work together because they are both about young people growing up in, in these spaces that aren't always safe and aren't always beautiful. Sometimes you have to look a little closer, look a little deeper. Um, but they are most definitely always about family. And they're always about the loved ones that are there, which is what home is. And, you know, why um, I was asked earlier today, I was doing an interview at CB, on CBC, which will air tomorrow morning. Um, I should plug that. Good job, Kate. Um, and it was a really difficult question. It was that question of what do you hope people to get out of your work, which is always a hard question to answer because as a, as a writer, as a creator of anything, when you put it out into the world, there's a certain amount of control that is completely lost. And I have no idea what people could take from it. My, own, my work is done. My work is done in the writing of it. And then I have to just let it go and hope that I've done my job and that what I hope to convey went, went through the poetry or the book. Um, so when writing that, I, so I feel, un, so it's hard to answer that question because I don't know what people take from my work. I know what I want and what I hope to achieve is that people will look at these things that might not seem beautiful and look a little deeper and be able to find that beauty. And that's really hard to do. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes empathy. Sometimes it takes patience and really kind of a different understanding of what we're, what we're taught going, going forward. Because we're all taught our biases, we're all taught our prejudices, and we're all taught the things that are sometimes just there to keep you safe. And sometimes we have to unlearn those while still keeping ourselves safe. And mostly what I want to do is I want to convey people. Because I'm writing about my family, I'm writing about people who look like me, I'm writing about people who come from where I come from. And the most truth I can give 
is to show their humanity. This poem comes from a series of pictures, some of which actually exist, and some of which I uh, made up in my head, because I can do that, I'm a poet, I can make up all sorts of stuff. And this is about um, my brother, uh, who passed on when I was 14 and he was 18. And this is um, not only links to part of the book, because in the book we have a family member who has passed on and is still very much a part of the narrative, but it also links to my documentary, which was mentioned, which is called This River, which is available for free, at least in a trailer. I think it, you can see the whole thing on nfb.ca. And that one was not only exploring um, my own relationship to the river, which is where my brother died, but also other people's relationship with the river, because unfortunately these beautiful river spaces are often the place where people are lost, and thus they are places where people search for missing loved ones. But first we'll start with some pictures. <coughs> and this is very creatively numbered, and it's called Picture, because it's creative, and it's called One. In the front hallway, his sister watches him tie his shoes, a foot propped up on a small stool. He wears jeans the color of snow, a jacket blue and thin, even though it is such a cold November. He wears a black concert t-shirt with bright writing and an eagle clutching a large peace sign in its claws. Two. He tosses and feathers his soft black hair with thin brown hands, checks his reflection in the mirror. His sister asks him to borrow a sweater. He hesitates, teases, finally says, fine. He turns at the door and smirks, waves. The wind pushes his hair over his face, and he is gone. Three. Her mother picks several pictures to put in the newspaper, different ones showing different things, multiple profiles. But the newspaper takes the one with his hat hung low, half his face in shadow. The headline reads, Native Man Missing After Binge. She cuts it out, folds it in two, and puts it in the photo album. She thinks he would like it, that they called him a man. I'll read one more picture, because part of what, pictures become very important when, when family loved ones are missing. Not only the picture of what they were last wearing, which becomes very important for a search, but also that picture that is put out into the world. Um, it actually, studies have shown that how that picture looks is really determines how much people, you know, care. Um, so to, to say those things about an 18-year-old man, young man, because really 18-year-olds, you're not men yet. Um, <laughs> such an anti thing to say, you're not a man yet. Um, I'm sorry, totally man. Um, and, and really to put that disclaimer on it, really, first of all, it's impractical because you can't see the person's face. And second of all, it really frames the narrative of that story very poorly. So I chose, of course, to remember him differently. And this is one, it's an actual picture of my brother as a baby. Dirty face smiles. Diaper hangs to dark knees, caked with mud, almost the same color as his sun-kissed cheeks. Kissed a lot, this wild baby happy in the grass. Pause for a breath and a picture, now as ruddy as the child in it. Edges frayed by, by being pocketed too long. Colors faded, absent-minded fold marks make a trail over his feet erases his toes. So moving over to River Woman, totally plugging my wares here, hey? 
Um, I always say I don't try to flock, hawk books, flock books. That always seems, particularly to students, I always remind writers and remind everyone that taking books out by writers out of the library, we still get a portion of that through the um, public lending right. So if you can't afford a book and you want to take it out of the library, that's still helping your writers. As I re read from multiple books here. <laughs> so this is River Woman. So if trees were the growing metaphor of the last book, um, anyone, any guesses to what this one is about? <laughs> like I said, I have a very complicated relationship with the river. And while filming this river, um, I got to spend several days sitting on a boat, just being in the water. Um, as a medium, and I write in, in several different genres in several different ways, um, but film is really wonderful because one, it's very much like poetry, it's very visual, and as a director, I really got to you know, literally tell someone with way more talent than me to just, you know, show the river as beautiful. Look at that, look at that, look at that. And then she just did it, and it was great. Um, and I, but the other thing about film as a medium is you get to collaborate with others so that it wasn't just beautiful shots of the river, there was actually a, you know, story in there. Um, if left to my own devices, it would have only been glam shots of the river the whole way through. No talking, no nothing. Um, but the other thing that comes with film is there's a lot of filming. For that 20 minute um, film, we, we shot about eight full days, like 16 hour days of just footage. Um, and there's probably a good dozen films in all of that footage if we ever were of a mind to put things together and make something new. Um, but then at the end of the editing process, no one wants to revisit that stuff ever, ever again. Um, because editing is universal. It's universally a drag. And it takes up way more time than actually writing the stuff um, in film and in books. Um, and by the time you're end you're, you, you've ended the process, you are just ready to send it out into the world, however it looks. <laughs> but you also get a lot of time with all that filming of really sitting around. So these poems were written, um, mo some of them, most of them were written in that time that I was just sitting along the river contemplating its beauty and where I was going to point Iris, who was our cinematographer, um, to next. Um, really looking at that relationship I had with her, the river, um, and this place that I've lived next to my whole life. Um, this really powerful being um, that unfortunately is also very deadly, um, a deadly thing. And un unfortunately, we have these relationships with rivers in, in every city, in everywhere. I know I uh, went to Australia and there's similar stories of uh, one particular river near in the Northern Territory where many indigenous women have been gone missing and the search has surrounded the river because that was used as their hiding place um, for the people who, who took them. Um, and also too, I know in Saskatchewan, we have so, there's similar relationships with the river and similar searches that have happened through. Um, every city in Canada, um, is built on a waterway. And that's, that's the reason the cities were, were put in that places because people went up the river or the lake or the inlet and they said this was a good place to set up camp and they did. Um, and that's indigenous folks and then the settlers also tended to go in those spaces as well. Um, there's only one city that is originated in a place that didn't have a natural body of water. Does anyone know where, oh, we got nods. We're in Saskatchewan, we know what we're talking about. That's Regina. Yeah, yeah, that's my, my trivia for the day. Um, Regina actually was, um, and, and correct me if I'm getting these facts wrong, because I often get facts wrong, I'm a poet. Um, so I just, you know, look after, like look for the bright shiny thing and then forget, you know, things like dates. Um, but Regina was originally a military outpost, RCMP outpost at Northwest, Northwest Mountain Police. I'm getting shakes. I don't, it was an outpost of some kind. Um, and still it still is. <laughs> That's Saskatoon for you. 
Um, and originally, someone told me, and this might be BS, because I do filter a lot of BS. Um, I talk to a lot of, you know, Métis people, and they usually just tell me, you know, BS. Um, that's my nation. I can talk shit about them. Um, but originally, the railroad was supposed to go north through Saskatoon. We got nods? Are we gonna, okay. But they moved it after 1885 because we made a big fuss up here. Sorry about that. Um, and then they moved it to Regina, which is when they made the lake, which was, oh, someone told me the name of it. What was? Wasco. And that means something in Cree. Anyone know? Anyone remember? Someone just told me that, and it was lovely. And I'm, yeah, didn't, see? I just look after the bright, shiny things. I forget these things like facts. Anyway, this is River Woman. <laughs> I'm really bad at preambling today. I'm delirious. I've been up since five. I've been talking to people all day. I'm an introvert. <laughs> <sighs> this river is a woman. She is bright and she is beautiful. I pressed the wrong button, I'm sorry. Darren Surrey. This river is a woman. She is bright and she is beautiful. She once carried every nation here, but she is one of those women. Too soon forgotten and broken like a body that begs without words, only rough hands that reach out palms up. This river is a woman, and she has been dragged and dragged. Metal coils catch her tangled hair, and everyone wants to know her secrets, but she keeps them. She won't let them go unless she trusts you, unless you ask real nice, unless she just feels like it. This river is a woman, and she is full of good intentions, bad regrets, and sometimes she just folds into herself, can slow to a slush, then rush into race, currents indiscernible, patterns intangible, and below she goes even faster. This river is a woman forever returning, twisting north, a snake carved into prairie grass, hiding everywhere, eroded with age etched into her edges and newly born every day. This river is your lover. She curls around you, pulses and fills you like heartbeat. And if you are very quiet, all you hear is her. This river is your mother. She flows on and on and unnoticed, slips in and slides out as if she was never here, as if she was always here. This river is my sister. She is bright and beautiful and brown, sings soft every summer, holds us up all winter, and every spring she swells, reminds us we are just visitors here. This is her country. She is that woman. Her deft voice reaches out, broken by everything that has been thrown into her, but somehow her spirit rages on. Somehow a song like her can never Fade. So like I said, we were looking at the river and making this documentary. Um, my, brother, my brother was found um, in the water. He was found up in uh, Lake Winnipeg, which is north where the Red River flows into Lake Winnipeg. Um, we were very lucky to find him. I say that, not that it was a happy ending to the story. He had passed in the water. Um, but we were very lucky to find him because there are literally thousands of people who've been lost in rivers who have not been found. So I do feel very fortunate that my family was able to bring him home and have that ceremony. Um, I also live half a block away from the river. I grew up about two blocks away from the river and always spent my time around her. Um, and my family has lived along the river for generations, um, which is, I'm, I'm not afraid of water. I've never been afraid of water, but my grandmother was deathly afraid of the river. And she lived in St. Boniface until 1950, where there was a large flood. 
And this family story always went that as she watched the water creep slowly towards her house, uh, she packed up her things and her children, and she um, went to go stay with her sister in Willow Bunch, Saskatchewan, oddly enough. Um, and she refused to go back there. And her husband actually had to um, find a new house. He was fortunate enough to, to buy a property kind of outside the city at the time. It, now it's in the middle of the suburbs. Um, but that was the story she always told us, that she was just afraid of the water. Um, I'm since going through this process of, of talking, and it's my favorite project. I'm talking with my aunt, uncle, who just turned 81. And he's the oldest member of our family for a couple generations. Um, and he's so shy. I love it. He just doesn't understand how much he holds and how much power he has in all of his memories. Um, and he's so reluctant to talk, so I have to like bribe him with uh, Tim Horton's muffins. Um, and I'm, and I'm sec I keep saying this, he's gonna totally find out. Sometimes I secretly record him, and I don't tell him, and he has no idea what I'm doing, because you know, he's 81, and he doesn't even know what this thing is. Um, and I'm afraid to listen, because um, I mean, I'm just doing it like to try to keep track of everything. And, um, but anyway, the story he said was that um, while they were living in St. Boniface, um, my family lived there. Um, my grandfather moved to St. Boniface. Um, they had lived there originally um, and then got uh, relocated forcibly. Um, which happened to many Métis families. And so our family was kind of transient for a couple generations. And um, he moved back to St. Boniface because that was where his jobs were and where he could get opportunity. Um, and my grandmother refused to live there because of the blatant racism that, was, that the family kept facing. And I always find that it, it's sad on many levels, but it's also sad that in the place that their ancestors founded, they were not welcome. Like the exact place. But I still think of her and her, she was definitely afraid of water and she really didn't like the river much. Um, and it's funny thinking about that fear of water and how that comes from and how that, how that carries with us. And I'm really looking at it right now um, with my daughter, she's 16 months old um, and it took her so long, she was always so afraid of water. And still, I have to coax her in to places with water because it's this fear she has. And it, it never came from me. Like, and my other daughters are like, you know, we're, we're little swimmers as soon as they, you know, could slip out of my arms. Um, so it's, it's weird. And I think about those, those things that we just bring with us from the spirit and world and, and what, uh, where that could possibly come from. And maybe it comes from my grandmother. Um, we're working through it. We're getting, we got some swimming lessons down. You know, we got lots of bath toys, you know. It's, it's gonna, it's gonna come up. It's gonna come up. It says where? Not up in the groomed grass of the pretty park. Not in the hilly bush high with growth and garbage. Not kneeling on those polished pews. Not even where the upright stones bruise the earth. Not at the streets where the fake flowers faded long ago, or where the wounds open every night and cry out. Not on the bridge where some went, or at the old dock where others were taken. But here near this last bend in the river, here where the trees break off and their leaves dance high with song. Here where the water licks the sky like smoke and the concrete is so old and smoothed as rock. Here where the dock broke off and the edge is low, where the wind moves quick in and long out. There is still tobacco and there is still fire. Here with the river is where I will always remember. See, poetry reading. You guys did good. First poetry reading, anyone? Ah, you didn't know that that was going to happen. I'm going to read one more because I'm totally keeping track of time today. I was late for most of the day. 
my poor itinerary was just blown to smithereens, um, cut into my free time. <laughs> but I fixed it. So because I'm up here, and because I was talking to um, a couple dear ladies from the Gabrielle Dumont Institute and committed in front of people that I want to go to Batash this summer. I, I, I went to Batash one summer, many summers ago. Um, I didn't know it was Batash days. I came on like the last day, you know, and the last day of those things, they're, they're always so sad just because everyone's so tired and hot and they're wearing all those period costumes and they're like, you know, get me out of here. Um, <laughs> but I haven't been back since and I always, always mean to, but you know, kids and things always get in the way. So I'm committing to going this year, um, if only to be there again. And also because I'm writing a book about Batash, so I should really go there. Uh, it's, um, so this is about my first time at Batash a few years ago. And uh, like I said, it was Batash days, and everyone was really like, hey, welcome to Batash days. And uh, I was in a really sad mood that day. We, we had kind of gone on this little tour of Saskatchewan, and it was wonderful. And we went down to Willow Bunch, which of course has the famous giant and the really creepy museum. Um, uh, Willow Bunch was founded by about 20 to 22, depending on who you talk to, Métis families. And you go there now, and I remember talking to the lady at the gas station, and she was like, there's no Métis around here. And I'm like, ha ha, <laughs> we're everywhere. <laughs> um, and also, too, claim to fame, Edouard Beaupré, the, the Willow Bunch giant, who grew to be eight foot two and was actually in the circus the turn of the century, in Barnum and Bailey's circus. Um, um, he has a, he's a fascinating story. I, I urge you to look him up. He's, it's a brilliant story. It's really sad and um, brilliant <laughs> and sad. Um, but so we went up to Willow Bunch, and then we drove all the way up to Batash. Um, which was a long day, and when I got to Batash, I was really, it's, I wasn't ready to be happy, and I wasn't ready to be at celebrating, because it's a very sad place. It's a graveyard. It's a, it's a, you know, a place of a very sad battle, um, and it's, it's a, a place I really um, felt needed quiet. So like any good poet, I took my bad mood and I, my journal, and I went off into the graveyard and wrote a poem. I was emo before there was such a thing as emo. <laughs> and this is, and I, and I, and it's so emo, I called it Bury Me at Batash. <laughs> I like how I, I really laugh and then they become really sad poems. <laughs> I like that balance. <laughs> I hope you do too. <laughs> Bury me at Batash. <clears throat> Bury me at Batash where their old shacks still stand. Paint peels from weathered wood, but inside they smell like sweet grass, sound like whispers. Bury me behind there, behind them in the graveyard where the stones hinge the clouds in the Saskatchewan River, where the wooden crosses tilt to the sun and a wind answers in a language I only know in my bones, but every name is family. I can still hear them. They crowd around the fiddle. They dance gentle in the grass. Bury me there. Past the gift shop and the walkway where quotations decorate pixelated photos of dead men and the story is shown at the top of every hour. Same film used for two languages, overdubbed both ways, so both look like they're not coming out of those mouths right. Bury me in the shadow of the church with its round flower window. Bury me there because that's where Grammaire will be. She will light candles for those who went before us, but I'll just stay out here and wait. Where I can still see them, down in the coolies, their gun barrels pointed east. Rough men in dirty shirts whose sleeves billow like worn flags. Rifle iron scrapes and red coats shout on the horizon. Bury me here, where everyone lost and everything changed. Behind the new iron, cast iron fence that shines, welcome to the graveyard along the river. A marble pillar notes a history in Cree first, before French, before English. Put me in the back, 
where most headstones are hand-carved, fallen over but propped back up, where water rumbles like hunger and the birch leaves still dance in the sun. Thank you. Okay. I forgot to mention there are questions, and I love questions, so please ask a question. I answer everything. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanne Liao. I'm a professor at the English department. I'm just here to help out, um, especially if anyone's feeling too shy, but otherwise I do encourage anybody to come up. Um, we do have until, are you sticking to your schedule? Well, I'm so far. Okay. I got, I got All story. right, so we, we do have like 15 minutes for questions. Okay. Um, I found the trauma of motherhood and maternity to be very interesting in the break. Um, so I was just wondering how you envision this trauma to take place in Phoenix and her child. I'm sorry, can you repeat? Oh, this? sorry. Um, how do you think the trauma of motherhood and maternity will impact Phoenix and her child? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't hear Phoenix in that. Oh, I, the weird echo. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> funny you should say that. Um, officially, not officially, I, the, the story does go on in my head. And, um, and, I'm, and I, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of exploring that at the moment. And um, I do... Phoenix is a hard one because Phoenix is um, very much a antagonist in the book. She is very uh, complicated. She is very violent. Um, she is very pregnant at the end of the book. Um, but at the same time, though, I wanted to give her maybe a little bit of quiet time. I, the whole book was me trying to find quiet spaces for, for these people to rest because so much was going on. And I did want that for Phoenix also. Um, but I also don't think her story is wrapped up in a neat little bow. And she's not going to, um, you know, just turn the page and suddenly become this beautiful blossoming mother. I don't think that um, it's in, within her to do that without extensive therapy. Um, I also think that now, you know, from a very uh, practical standpoint, she's about, she's facing prison whether that be juvenile detention or adult prison, which is what is being discussed at the, moment, at the end of the book. Um, so often uh, what happens to women who birth in prison is, uh, is actually quite traumatizing. Um, if you look, there's several studies that have been done in Canada. There's supposed to be maternity wards in several prisons in Canada, and most of them are underfunded and understaffed. Um, they're actually really hard things to manage, I would imagine, hard places to manage. Um, and most uh, women who are incarcerated who give birth, their children immediately go into care, um, which is where Phoenix was and, and likely where her child would go, unless she could find a relative that would take care of her child or a relative of um, Clayton, who is her baby's father. Um, so I really don't know how Phoenix is going to you know, not only handle motherhood, but if she would even be allowed to mother, because uh, it would undoubtedly be a, an immediate separation from her and her child. Um, and it's actually, there. there's, uh, I, I research all sorts of bizarre things on the internet, and, and uh, researching like maternal experience and birth experience in prisons are, is actually very sad, because often women end up laboring alone, or they end up laboring in shackles, and having gone through that process in my life, having very recently gone through that process, I can't imagine even the, that physical action of being shackled while you're birthing um, seems incredibly oppressive. I understand all the reasons behind, you know, especially with violent people, um, but it's actually a very inhumane way to birth. Uh, so I hope for the best, and, uh, and we'll see where, where things go.
But thank you, thank you for that. I love how, see these are people in my head that I just kind of made up and became my friends. So I really love that, you know, they're your friends too. It's very, it's less crazy when we talk about fictitious people as a group, <laughs> you know, as opposed to just me and my dogs. Hi. Hi. I was at your talk earlier at uh, Gordon Oaks, and y there you said that the break is fiction, but that it's also your truth. And <laughs> you also said that you are genre fluid. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bad dad joke, said with great respect. So I was wondering, <laughs> did you consider at all um, writing the, on, that content in nonfiction? Um, no. <laughs> That's a really abrupt answer, I'm sorry. Um, and I talked about this actually earlier today with the Indigenous students. Um, memoir is a really big thing, and I really do admire people who write nonfiction, but for me, I can't. And not only can't, I just, I won't. Um, because my story is not my own, my story also involves many other people that I love and who would absolutely disown me if I told the truth. Um, and that's fine, I've accepted that, I'm okay. I, I just make shit up, so it's great. It, um, and it totally, you know, um, I do think, I do say, like, fiction can be truth. And, and often, and truth doesn't have to just be factual. You know, what it, what's fictitious about the break is the scenarios that I put together. Um, for very purposeful ways and the characters that were made up for different reasons and in different ways. Um, but they're still going through a very real, truthful human experience and in that way it's, it's truth. And I wanted it to be true to uh, the people they were loosely based on, like they, they were all, you know, Métis or Anishinaabe women. So I wanted to model them after those strong women that I knew. So in that way it's truth and I wanted it to be true to that. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, um, I think when I'm like 80, I'm going to totally go whole hog on that memoir and just like let her rip. Um, but yeah, and you know, while my mother's alive, it's not going to happen. <laughs> For everyone's sake. And maybe, yeah, maybe my daughters will have to like be really old and kind of senile also. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Do we have another question? Yes, we do. The mics are always so high. Yeah. Thank you for, oh, thanks for the thank assistance. You. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I feel like a rock star now. <laughs> I, I feel like one. I know. I, I feel like um, Freddie Mercury. How we, yeah. 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 Like that. <laughs> uh, but that's got nothing to do with what I wanted to say. <laughs> I recently just bought Toni Morrison's, um, it's, it's a, a tome actually full of her essays and meditations and her nonfiction work. And she said she wouldn't write a memoir because she didn't think her life was interesting enough. <laughs> um, but I think, I just wanted to say, I think that fiction, even though I consider myself a nonfiction writer, I think fiction has tremendous power to make social change. And I wanted to congratulate you on the break because I think every Canadian should read it and that it will go far in our work towards reconciliation um, for Canadians to read it and, li and take action with it. Thank you, thank you. So I don't really, I have a really boring question that I hope you have an interesting answer for. Okay. <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. Um, pressure. What, as a writer who struggles with work and writing and family and, and life, what is a typical day like for you? Um, thank you for that and thank you for your rock star question. Um, my typical day, I'm very fortunate right now because right now I don't have a day job I have to leave my house for. Um, I'm, I'm currently um, the writer in residence at Athabasca University, which is an online university, and am accepting writers from all across Canada um, to submit work um, that I review, which is a really fun gig to do if you like talking about writing, which I do. Um, and I also teach online at, at U of T. So I don't have to, like, you know, I wear yoga pants all the time. 
which is great. Um, so, so typically right now my days is uh, I have a young baby at home. So it's really, my days starts with getting everybody out of the house. That's, that's the goal. Um, I also have teenagers. Um, and then I get to come and be blissfully by myself. And, and I get to make my own schedules because online work is, is wonderful too because it's flexible. For, for me, my writing time is in the morning. I don't think well after, you know, that three o'clock, you know, need for sugar part. You know, my brain just shuts off after that. And I've never been the kind of writer that, I know some writers who can write on their lunch hours and they can write on the bus and they can write on any spare moment. Uh, my friend David Robertson um, writes like five books a year. Um, he really does, he writes a tremendous amount of books. And he does things like writes at his kids' swimming lessons and things like that. Um, I've never been able to do that, mostly because my content is really heavy. <laughs> so I, I find I need lots of space. So I do need to carve up a lot of time for that. And for me, my brain works best in the morning. So usually in the mornings I'm writing, um, you know, I'm, I have a beautiful writing chair in front of a window that I can stare out of, and I call it working. Um, it's, you know, my, my family does respect the fact that when I'm staring out the window, I'm working. Um, and, uh, and it's just me and my, my dogs. And then I get to end the day with a dog walk to really get out of that space. Because, uh, yeah. And I always rec I recommend for people with writer's block to just get an animal. Because the animal will have something they'll make you do at some point in the day that'll really just get you out of that headspace and gives you lots of thinking time. So for us, we go to the dog park and I let my puppy run um, and my little old lady dog bark at everybody um, and I really just plot things out as I need to before I have to go pick up the kids and start the process all over again. But it's, uh, it's really lovely and it's, it's really a process of making time um, and they always say that, and it's a really hard thing to do. For years, I went to school. For years, I was a single mom, and I had to work a lot, and I didn't have the freedom of working from home, and I didn't have the freedom from, you know, working a job I like. <laughs> um, no, just kidding. I really liked the jobs I w was given, <laughs> old employers. Um, and I went to school, and there was always something going on, but, um, and it's really hard to carve up that writing space. And often I would get up early on Saturday mornings just to use that space that I have, because you use any old space you can get. Um, but it's really important to make that for yourself, because from what I know is that the stories don't leave you and the poems don't leave you. They just like, you know, they kind of stay in your head and they bug you until you put them down. Um, so you need to give them time. Yeah, and it, it it quiets the voices in your head to make room for the other voices, which are characters. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's all. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, yes. I think I see one. All right. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> um, recently, uh, Eleanor Sunchild, um, she's a lawyer here in Saskatchewan. Um, made a comment in uh, about police force in Saskatchewan um, about having uh, indigenous people in the police force and one of the thing one of the comments she made was that we can't just have uh, indigenous and Métis people in the police force without having knowledge of where they come from uh, otherwise they're just brown faces against indigenous people um, and the character Tommy, uh, I found, even though it was written in 2016, actually is um, really relevant to that comment, which was made just last week. <laughs> uh, did, did that, when you were writing Tommy, was his, um, his, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, Sorry, she's my prof, she knows I do this all the time. <laughs> um, was his like exploration into his own identity really important to you in writing his character, especially as a police officer in the North End? It really was. Um, thank you for that. I, 
Tommy came a little later in the process of writing the book um, because I, you know, and then he was a guy. He was very different than everybody else, um, and he came from that place. I've known. I've I've worked in um, in the inner city for many years, so I knew a lot of police officers, and I knew some police officers who were of different indigenous nations, and I always thought that was such a complicated, interesting relationship to have. Um, so I started kind of looking into it and asking questions about how that experience must be like. Because for me, as a kid growing up, I had a very different relationship with the police. Um, it, it always, it didn't feel like they were, though you know as a child that they're there to help you, um, I also felt, I also witnessed a lot of their harassment um, just by who we were. And in all fairness, we were, you know, hanging around places we shouldn't, doing things we shouldn't, but still. Um, but it wasn't an amicable relationship, it was a fraught relationship. So I imagine that's really complicated, as is someone like Tommy, who um, I know from, and many Métis people, many um, passing pe white passing people go through this experience of really wanting to be on this side and really wanting to deny who they are in a holistic way. Um, so Tommy kind of gave me that I gave me the vehicle to kind of play with those ideas. I know, like in in Tommy's chapters, we were I was talking about uh, status card versus Métis card and all of those things. Um, it's really hard. the the whole I, I, Métis identity is really difficult to talk about. Um, often people like the quick little definition, and the definition I always find is incomplete because it's not half of anything. It's not. Um, uh, you know, we're not sections, we're humans. Um, so I really wanted to explore that way of how not only he is grappling with his own personal identity, but also his professional identity and really trying to do good. He comes from a good place. And I think many, many people who do frontline work of all kinds, including police officers, come from that place of wanting to help. Um, but often what happens is the world is very hard and people get jaded and it's very difficult. Um, the other thing I got to do with Tommy is because he was in, in such a uh, really active place um, like a, the police service is uh, he got to kind of witness those incidents of casual racism, which is, uh, is again one of those things that are really hard to talk about because they're not malicious, they're not overt, they're really kind of subtle and micro, subtle microaggressions that many of us go through the world. and don't even t mention anymore because it would you, we wouldn't get anything else done. Um, so it's, yeah, I kind of really, I put a lot on him, poor guy, you know, and then he had to solve the, the case and, and save the day and poor Tommy. Um, good thing his mom's around to answer all his questions for him. Um, so I, I did, uh, I, I really think it's, it's a conversation, like I don't know that I have any answers or I found any answers. I, you know, mostly what I do is just make more questions for myself. Um, but I do think it's a really interesting relationship that, that people have. As many of us have, I think, who, you know, you know, who, uh, you know, are kind of a part of these systems that have actually historically oppressed us. Um, I, I think of my own family and how many of my families worked for um, the, the trains which are, you know, were actually historically responsible for dislocating many of us, um, but then gave us jobs, so yeah, yes. Um, but, and similar things are happening in many um, communities in my province with hydro. Hydro has disseminated land and then given jobs, and then so people are working for them. So I think it's, you know, it's not as easy as just being like anti and black and white. I think it's really, yeah, it's, there's a lot there. And I wanted to even just start some of that, make a big mess for myself <laughs> to answer next time. <laughs> but thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Um, that's Sharon, my student. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Katerina. And I, I, I thank you for providing that, I mean, really difficult answers, I think, to really complex questions that your work in poetry and prose has raised. Um, and so before we sort of round off everything, we do, I want you to give the door gift. Oh, which okay. is your book. <laughs> um, so if you look under your seat, you might find one of these. 
um, which is a little card with an image of the book. I've been also told to instruct you that if you don't find it, look at the chair next to you if it happens to be empty. No fighting. You get two chances. <laughs> two roll up the wins. It's like roll up the chairs. I, I hope they didn't put it under the reserve one. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Check those, check those. Check those, check those. It wouldn't be up there. Would it be up there? I uh, know, no. no. <laughs> yep. yay. Oh, yay! Excellent. So, if you please um, just step up first, so we can. I'll just uh, let Dean Peter take over back again, but thank you so much for all your questions, and thank you very much, Catalina, again. Dana waits, ma'am. There you go. There you go. Uh, thank you, Joanne, uh, for the questions, or for... <laughs> directing or what? Anyway, whatever. Okay. Um, before we um, leave for the night, and uh, there's a few things, that, a few people I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, predominantly, of course, I uh, want to, uh, on behalf of the College of Arts and Science, say thank you very, very much for uh, not just this evening, but this whole day. As you mentioned, it's been a long day for you. Um, but uh, it's, I, I think so, a good day from every, every aspect, uh, from what I've heard from everybody. Everything was very well attended. You had lots of questions along the way. Your writing stimulates those questions. And uh, I, once again, just want to say thank you for being our book club author for 2019. Thank you so much. My thank you. Just a, a little token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, a few acknowledgements before we go. Uh, thank you to the members of the book club for choosing such a book as The Break and inviting Katharina here today. Um, I think, as we've already mentioned, that it's been a very fruitful day for everybody who's participated, our students, uh, our communities. Uh, thank you once again, Katharina. Thank you also to uh, Jeanette Lines, doc, sorry, Dr. Jeanette Lines, head of the MFA in writing program, uh, Dr. Wendy Roy, head of the Department of English, both are here. Give a little wave to everybody. Come on, let's see who. There you go. Um, thank you to Dr. Dirk DeBoer for being MC at our discussion this afternoon. Thank you to Candace Wasakase Lafferty and her team at the Aboriginal Student Centre for their help and advice at the uh, Gordon Oaks Red Bear Centre. <laughs> and thank you to the communications and events team for organizing all of the book club events. So. So I just wanted to add an extra note to that. Uh, the day uh, has gone off very smoothly, and that only happens when you have a team that works so well together, like the communications team that we have in the college. So um, I think Katharina will be here with us until 8.30 today, or whenever she decides not to be here with us at, uh, <laughs> this evening. And we'll be signing uh, books. You can also purchase books from the bookstore table at the back of the room. Also, uh, before you go, just don't, even though it's a beautiful day today, the sun was out, it's actually not minus 20 outside, we do have refreshments out in the foyer, so please mix and mingle. Uh, take a minute, if you were too shy to come up to the, uh, to the mic and uh, ask a question of uh, Katharina, please. I'm sure she'd be more than willing to take as many questions as you can throw at her until 8.30 or until she decides <laughs> otherwise. So uh, please, refreshments in the hallway. Thank you, everyone, for coming out, and have a good night. Thank you.